thinking about cognitive functions in epilepsy, I think one of the things, as we've talked about so many times today, is HH is a rare condition. And so many of you can really feel like you're kind of out there on your own and that there's really kind of nobody else dealing with some of these things. And certainly HH is incredibly unique. And as we've talked about today already, uh, it's a very unique sort of special syndrome. But there are some similarities and some things that we can kind of draw from from other areas. Epilepsy and cognitive functioning in epilepsy, particularly for epilepsy that starts early in childhood, as it often does with HH, there are a number of similarities. Um, we talk about the thinking-related skills, problems that some of these HH kids have, and in general for epilepsies associated with some cognitive difficulties, particularly when it's starting very early in childhood, particularly if it's in the first couple years of life. There is uh, an increased risk of intellectual disability in general for just for epilepsy in general for kids that have seizures starting very early, particularly if it's daily seizures, which as many of you know, with HHs is particularly prone to more daily, more frequent seizures. And refractory epilepsy, meaning epilepsy that isn't responding to medications, uh, like Dr. Wolfong already spoke about this morning, is, is even more associated with sort of that cognitive decline, okay, which we can see oftentimes again in HH, which is another, it's a very refractory to medications type of epilepsy. So just that there are some commonalities in there with the folks that, that are epilepsy in general, and as Dr. Wolfong already said, that there's, there's a huge number of folks out there with epilepsy, okay? So part of that is just said so you don't feel quite so alone in, in some of the experiences of things, uh, while HH is certainly very unique. Um, moving on to cognitive functioning in HH specifically, particularly pretreatment, uh, I'll kind of give the overview of the different areas. Intellectual functioning, kind of a broad topic. Um, you know, we all kind of talk about it like we know what it is, and I, I love the definition that I was given once when I asked as I was a graduate student in neuropsychology and I said, we're learning all these IQ tests. I'm like, well, what is IQ really? And it's like, IQ is basically what intelligence tests measure. So <laughs> it's whatever is in, for that, you know, the, the culture and, you know, certainly in, in sort of the more westernized cultures, you know, we're looking at vocabulary, verbal abstract reasoning, but we also, and that tends to be very dominant in western cultures, but also some of those visual spatial skills. Can you kind of reason and problem solve through things, you know, puzzles and things like that that we do is included in that. Then also when that all gets lumped sort of how fast or how quickly you can kind of process information and adapt. It's not supposed to be exactly things that you learn and memorize, but kind of how flexibly can you think and problem solve and abstract broadly. But in general, about two thirds of the kids, usually it's kids, but in folks within um, HH and epilepsy, and I should say that we're talking about HH with epilepsy. This is separate from HH with precocious puberty only. They tend to be normal intellectual functioning and not have this whole constellation of the syndrome of things that we're talking about and focusing on today. So HH uh, with epilepsy. So about two thirds are gonna show some type of a developmental delay or impairment in intellectual functioning. That varies widely, okay? If you are kind of group everybody together and look at the means, it tends to be in kind of that low average range to kind of a mild impairment, low average to borderline range of intellectual functioning. And we've found that seizure frequency and severity does tend to correlate with broad cognitive ability, as you might expect. Sort of the worse the seizures and the more frequently they're occurring, the greater the risk of there being some cognitive, um, cognitive difficulties associated with that. As has already been touched on, um, and, and I think it, we didn't necessarily pay as much attention to the sort of the milder end of the spectrum of the adults that are first time presenting with HH, but they, they do tend to have a little bit milder syndrome in general. Those that don't present themselves to the medical community with seizures or some related problem until adolescence or adulthood, usually it's because it's a milder syndrome and they tend to fare better overall. Uh, we have as documented again and again, though it doesn't happen to everybody, it does seem to happen to the majority that there is a risk of sort of a decline in overall cognitive functioning with continued seizures, okay? So that idea that seizures are bad for the brain, particularly as you're progressing into some of those other, um, you know, there's the gelastic seizures, but particularly as you're progressing, those spread into the other types of seizures, the complex partial and uh, 
general isotonic clonic seizures, things like that, we're seeing that where there's that seizure progression, we're seeing often some decline in the cognitive functioning. And there's a suggestion, while it doesn't always correlate really well, there's some suggestion, and it's been inconsistently found, that some of the very, very large HOH may be associated with some of the worst cognitive functioning. Um, attention, attention is a complex process. There's sort of a brief attention, that ability to just, you know, okay, can you can remember a phone number that you just looked up? Not that anybody looks up phone numbers anymore. Um, but that you just looked up long enough <laughs> to hold on to it to go and dial it. Um, but that there's that, but then there's also the type of attention that you guys are using today. You're having to kind of pay attention through these longer lectures. And I'm sure you know, some of us are kind of drifting in and out a little bit, but how often are you drifting in and out and how much of what you're hearing today can you kind of retain and, and hang on to? A lot of people talk about memory problems, but you know, even before you get to memory, something first has to make it through that attentional filter. Okay, attention is that first filter. So if attention is bad, memory and almost everything else is going to look bad. Uh, when it's tested in the studies, it, it tends to be a more narrow definition of attention uh, that is given. So just sort of those brief little bit, can you focus on this just very briefly to you know, recite these numbers back or do these math problems in your head. Even then, it's often impaired. What's not necessarily systematically tested in a lot of the research that's been published though we certainly know it as neuropsychologists, that ability to sustain attention over a longer period of time, like what you folks are having to do today, is almost certainly um, impaired in these folks. It's very commonly impaired in epilepsy. Certainly, if you're having those abnormal electrical signals in your brain, the EEGs, all those things going off normally, that's gonna be interfering with your attentional process, okay? But there's that, that impaired ability to really sustain attention over time. Um, processing speed, I'm not going to spend as much time on this, but you can generally, you know, that's thinking speed in general is generally going to be reduced for folks as it, it commonly is. It, it tends to be in epilepsy in general and certainly in our HH group. Memory is one of the big ones, and I know there's going to be a specific memory talk later today, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, I will say that given the anatomy of things, and we've had some of the earlier speakers talk about the anatomy and kind of showed how... Um, when the HH is associated with mammillary bodies, that's when it's most likely to have epilepsy, right? Mammillary bodies happen to be crucial for memory functions, okay? So it makes a lot of sense that folks are going to be, with HH are going to be at risk of having some problems with memory. And that with continued seizures and things like that, if it's, already, if it's kind of feeding into those mammillary bodies, that that's gonna be disrupting that and that, that memory could decline over time. Um, so we, see some degree of impairment in most of the folks. Even those with kind of normal intellectual functioning, good cognitive skills overall, we see some variability in their cognitive profiles, but the memory is one of those areas that's certainly vulnerable, okay? And, and certainly vulnerable depending on the surgical approaches that are taken to for the treatment. So it, it is a, a tricky thing to get around. Language, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. it, it it's not often specifically looked at in the literature. There's not been any good studies that have really looked specifically at language, but in general, it seems to kind of go along with those general cognitive abilities, okay, the general things. There, there is also the note that though a number of folks with HH have sort of an autistic-like quality, one of the core features of autism, however, is some abnormalities in language or how it's used and that ability to acquire it or how to use it. Um, executive systems functioning, that's a fun term that we neuropsychologists like to use. Um, but it's basically, it's these higher order thinking skills, being able to put things together, problem solve, reason through things. If you kind of think of what an executive must do, they have to plan, they problem solve, but they also, you know, they have to be able to start activities at the appropriate time, start projects, but you also have to be able to put the, the brakes on things that are a bad idea, okay? That planning and being able to do that. So. It, it's almost universally going to be impaired with those with the folks with some degree of um, cognitive dysfunction. That mental flexibility, that ability to, to multitask, to go back and forth between a couple different things and pay attention. And for some of these kids, or you know, even things that could even be, you know, sort of paying attention to what the person in the lecture is saying and then taking some notes and then, you know, trying to distract out whatever my buddy is saying over here to the side of me or something like that. That's really going to be a problem for folks. And I said also in those executive functions, you can see that impulsivity, acting without thinking, 
as well as that you know, hard to put the brakes on things that I shouldn't be saying or doing at the time. This ties in a lot, I think, with that, the psychiatric comorbidity that people talk about a lot. So there's all these impulse control disorders and disruptive behavior. I just can't regulate. I can't regulate my attention and my, what I'm doing enough to kind of you know, put the brakes on when I need to and, and act when I should. Okay. Um, so sort of a broad summary of all of that. High variability, as Dr. Kerrigan already spoke about. This is really, really a variable condition. We have folks that are functioning near normally or normally, you know, I think. And then there's some that obviously have a very more, much more ca catastrophic condition, so wide range. Um, even for folks that are functioning kind of in the normal range, usually there's little blips on the screen. There's not everything isn't necessarily normal across the board, okay? The areas that are probably most vulnerable to difficulties are things such as attention, memory, speed, and that sort of executive functions multitasking. Um, speed and mental flexibility. And as we said, those with later onset of things tend to have a little bit better functioning. It's like the brain's had more time to develop normally and kind of develop sort of a, a base on which to, to move off of. Okay. So then moving into some of the more emotional or behavioral symptoms in HH and epilepsy. So again, I'm gonna focus first on epilepsy, okay? Epilepsy in general. Uh, what do we know about psychological functioning? And that's sort of a broad overview there. Again, in epilepsy in general, psychiatric symptoms and disorders are gonna be much more common in, than in the general population. You know, oftentimes rates twice, you know, for different classes, depending on the class of disorder, you know, twice as many or more than what you might see in just sort of that average general population, okay? Among the most common things that you're seeing, uh, disorders that you're seeing in epilepsy, depression is very common, not surprisingly. Uh, anxiety, some worry, and that could be either related to the condition itself or it could be even anxiety about, you know, having seizures in public or anything like that. ADHD, so again, that attention difficulties, hyperactivity, impulse control things, very, very common. And then psychosis, and that is something I'll spend a little bit more time on because it's something Lisa had, had brought up to me as wanting to touch on a little bit more, but psychosis is also more common in epilepsy than it is in the general population considerably. Uh, and psychosis is something that in the general population tends to be quite rare, you know, usually like less than 1% of people. Um, and, and looking at the literature, you see reference made oftentimes that these things, while we know they're there, they're often somewhat undertreated, even in epilepsy in general. Okay, we, you know, when you're having seizures, we want to control the seizures and things, but sometimes these other things don't necessarily get addressed to the same degree as if you didn't have a medical problem and you presented with this to your, your physicians with this, this problem. Okay. A few things to, when thinking about epilepsy in general and some of the psychological disorders that can go along with their psychological symptoms, timing is interesting. Okay, there's this idea of, you know, sometimes just before a seizure, parents will notice, or even people, adults with seizure disorders, they're more irritable or something else, or depressed, there's something, you know, right, kind of building up, you know, maybe those few hours or something before the seizure occurs, they can feel some things building. There's ictal, during the seizure itself, they might feel anxious, fear, sometimes that's associated with certain types of seizures. And then after the seizure, you know, what goes on, that post-ictal phase. And then interictal is just sort of more in general, is this sort of a more persistent thing, maybe um, outside of relation to the seizures themselves. Another thing to think about when you're talking about epilepsy and some of these psychological disorders, you've got the, the thing where the anti-epileptic medications can improve, depending on the medication itself, can either kind of improve or worsen psychiatric sy symptoms. Again, depending on the medication and the symptom you're talking about, there's known side effects with that. And, and the reverse is true as well. Some of the medications that you would utilize to treat depression, anxiety, ADHD, psychosis, can either, you know, kind of run the risk of either maybe helping the seizure problem or making it worse. So th that's why there's, you know, it's just gonna be so important to have good discussions with the neurologist, you know, the epileptologist, maybe in conjunction with the psychiatrist on some of these, because there, there's, there's a careful selection along those lines of how to treat things. And then, you know, are these things, you know, it's definitely been well documented that these disorders are more common in the epilepsy population. Is that related to the epilepsy itself? Something neurologically wrong with the brain, the brain is different, and so we produce these disorders, or is, are some of these things in reaction to, I've got this persistent medical condition and I've got some feelings about that, and it's, it's probably both. <laughs> 
Um, a, a few words about psychosis, because I was asked to speak on that a little bit more. Um, psychosis in general, just to give a definition, it is considered one of the more severe mental disorders or symptoms. Psychosis itself isn't a, a specific disorder. But it's, it's typically characterized by these disorders in thinking and perception, okay? So there are what we might class as the more, quote, positive symptoms. And when you hear positive, it doesn't mean that they're good, but it means that there's an excess, okay? You're adding something into the normal experience. So those would be things like delusions and hallucinations. Hallucinations, you know, that's, you know, we think of, you know, okay, you're hearing something that's not really there. You can also see things that aren't there. Uh, delusions, that is usually a very, very strongly held belief with, despite all evidence and everything's to the contrary, okay? Um, you know, the, the, the classic ones that get kind of joked about, you know, somebody that really believes like, you know, they're, you know, either God or Jesus or, you know, some of those types of things. But there's also several other delusions. It can be a very strongly held belief about something. Um, and in epilepsy is noteworthy because when psychosis occurs in epilepsy, there's a notable absence of those negative symptoms in comparison to folks who have schizophrenia, something like that, that would be diagnosed in the general population without an epilepsy, okay? So they're less likely to have those negative symptoms. The negative symptoms are the absence of behavior. So you can, sometimes folks with schizophrenia or something like that, they might have catatonia, where they just kind of can kind of sit and stare. I mean, that's just a lack of action or movement, you know, almost to a really dramatic degree sometimes. So they just, it's not gonna be any movement. There can be some flat affect. It's more that absence of behavior. Those things tend to be more absent, um, not a, a part of the psychosis that tends to occur, some with the epilepsy, and that's one thing that's kind of noteworthy. This suggests it's, it's different a little bit than our classic um, psychotic mental disorders that might occur in the general population. Okay. A little bit more on psychosis and epilepsy. And again, I will say that this psychosis and epilepsy is not necessarily my specialty, I, I will certainly say. And I, I'm a PhD, not an MD, so I don't prescribe medication. So I'm just gonna kind of give some overview of some things that uh, I have found in the literature in this area. One thing that was notable, and it also was described at least in one patient that had an HH, but certainly occurs in other um, epilepsies as well and was described there. So there's uh, the idea of the postictal psychosis, which is you know something if it's following a seizure, usually a flurry of seizures. And so there might be a period of time of kind of relatively normal stuff, and then a day or a few days later, then they start to develop those delusions or hallucinations, and you know more classically those positive symptoms of a psychotic episode. Um, and that's when there can be, and there was the distinction, you know, typically when you're having that type of a, a postictal psychosis that occurs in, in typical epilepsy. Um, there was the recommendation that's when you can kind of try those antipsychotic treatments just added in for that episode versus having to be on them all the time versus somebody who is having more of an interictal psychosis where even out, out of relation to anything going on with seizures, they're having some psychotic symptoms and it's, they're, they're going to be needed to be treated with some of those antipsychotic medications. There's also some suggestion in the literature that repeated episodes of a, a post-ictal psychosis can then sometimes morph into this more inter interictal or more broad or kind of overarching psychotic um, symptoms that are a little bit more lasting and occurring separate from the seizures themselves, okay? Um, I will note that at least one of the papers that's been done on this specific 2HH, uh, Vendrick Meeks uh, suggested that some of the psychotic symptoms in HH don't seem to respond as well to the antipsychotic medicines that we would use that typically tend to act pretty well on positive symptoms for schizophrenia and folks like that that are having psychotic symptoms separate from that. Um, again, it's an area where there's just not let, been a lot studied, particularly for the HH uh, population. Um, otherwise, talking about emotional behavioral functioning in HH more generally, um, I would kind of class them into kind of three or four categories. Certainly you have, I mean, there's a broad range of psychological disorders that have, have been occurred, but if you kind of think about it, you can kind of jump, lump them together into these domains. Probably most prominent and the most one that gets the most attention is talked about the most, probably because it happens, you see it the most in the kids and the parents are having to deal with the kids with these problems, is the impulse control disorders. So that's that aggressiveness, the rage, the rage reactions that we, we hear about so much as being part of the classic syndrome of HH. The ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, some of the problems with attention, 
hyperactivity, just disruptiveness, not being able to regulate very well, not being able to put the brakes on. Some are described as being oppositional defiant disorder. So, and that can kind of go along with some of that aggressiveness, that uh, not necessarily listening and following through to directions. Some have been described as having intermittent explosive disorder. Again, classically, they don't necessarily fit any one dis category very well. And so there's sort of a broad, kind of depending on who they've seen and how somebody's kind of conceptualized something, there's a, a broad range of diagnoses they might be given. But it's, it's often you know, going to be coming from the HH itself. Uh, and these are, and I'll speak a little bit more about the aggress aggressiveness in just a moment. The other comes with those mood and anxiety disorders, okay? Sort of like the anxiety, the more obsessive compulsive type qualities, depression, that's noted a lot, not only in epilepsy in general, but a very high rates in epilepsy uh, with HH in particular. And then there's sort of the social difficulty, sort of that a number of folks with HH um, some studies have suggested more often in the men than the women, but I, that might be a selection bias. Uh, some of the more autism-like, autism or Asperger's-like qualities, okay? Autism spectrum disorder, pervasive developmental disorder. There's a lot of labels that are kind of thrown around and that to describe that same general feeling, but there's just a little bit of being socially different, socially off, not quite getting that normal interpersonal interaction and flow and give and take of the, of the communication, particularly, you know, plus or minus some language difficulties or odd use of language with that. Uh, and then kind of coming into that too, you can get some social anxiety disorder, some, some little more avoidant personality, like I'm not so sure I'm real comfortable kind of being around people and socializing all that much. Um, there's also mention of, you know, sort of a schizotypal personality disorder, which is kind of where that a little bit of an avoidant oddity, not necessarily quite full psychosis, but we've got some odd thinking going on and, and usually a little bit uh, of um, yeah, social discomfort as well. And then as I said, as we've talked about some of those, the full um, psychotic disorders, which we're hearing a little bit more about, I know based on the things that Lisa has said, but also looking in the literature, I see the psychotic disorders mentioned more often in the papers and studies they're talking about the adult patients. Okay, probably then it, it comes up or I'm hearing about as much in the kids. Uh, a little bit more about the aggression. This is an often cited study, but it was probably one of the best or only really pretty systematic groups of looking at emotional functioning in uh, children with HH. So there were 12 children with HH and it was great. They used the siblings as control. They grew up in largely the same environment and things like that, so it was a great control, and this is probably the only kind of controlled study I've seen, or at least quasi-controlled study. And so let's look, you know, and they looked at how are these, some of these disorders occurring in the folks with the HH versus the siblings. Because the siblings, you know, again, if, there's, if, if depression and anxiety runs in the family, it's gonna run in the family in general, sort of that idea. Um, oppositional defiant disorder, definitely in terms of looking at who would, could meet that kind of that criteria. 80, over 83% of the HH kids, so the vast majority would have met that kind of criteria and including some anger and aggressive tendencies versus none of the siblings, okay? So that, again, this is something to do with the HH itself. Um, ADHD, again, very high, that, you know, hyperactivity, attention difficulties, extremely high. Conduct disorder, which is more, conduct disorder is sort of like the, the you're less than 18 years old version of, person, of uh, antisocial personality disorder, so that idea. So there, you're kind of, there's some, some rule breaking, often moving on to law breaking, you know, some real, you know, there's, you can be kind of oppositional, but conduct disorder is kind of taking it a step further, okay? Um, affective disorder, which is your things like your depression and things like that, certainly there, and then they may note of some of the learning difficulties as well. Um, a, a little bit more about that rage and the aggression in, in HH. So, that rage and aggression, while in general, I think the, the message I want to send kind of when thinking about our emotional disorders in general is, A, we need to address them. You know, we, we, A, we need to, you know, certainly we need to treat the seizures and things like that, but the emotional disorder should be addressed too, and we probably could have a little bit more involvement of psychiatry and things like that into kind of finding some ways to help treat these behavior disorders in HH and epilepsy. But the rage in particular has been noted to be kind of poorly responsive to medical management, okay? And, you know, the rage is classically described as, you know, it might be just minimal provocation. Certainly I have seen kids where 
they can be sitting, playing on the floor, and it's like somebody, and you know, nothing seems to happen, and all of a sudden they seem to just kind of get very aggressive, angry either towards themselves, something around their unplanned. So, you know, sometimes you see it without provocation, but or it can be very, very minimal provocation uh, that results in sort of this rage or ang aggressive outbursts. And it makes sense. As we kind of went through, some of the earlier speakers have talked about the neuroanatomy and where these things are in the hypothalamus itself. We know from a number of animal studies as well as some human studies that if you stimulate that hypothalamus, particularly in the right area, give it an electrical stimulation, it results in this rage or this, this reactive aggression. Okay, they've seen, done it in cats, they've done it in monkeys, a number of different animal studies. So we know, and we've just talked about where, how the HH tissue itself is sending these signals. It's got that, you know, that quality where it's automatically, the, the, the seizures and the signals are coming from that itself. So, you know, I, I, we, it's not been experimentally necessarily demonstrated, but it certainly you can imagine, and it would make sense as a theory, that those signals going out and stimulating the hypothalamus, if it's hit, you know, particularly posterior hypothalamus, re resulting in these sort of these rage or these aggressive reactions, okay? And there's kind of, and certainly that more reactive aggression that, that we see like in the animal studies when we've stimulated the hypothalamus in the right area is more like what we're typically seeing in HH kids and adults. Um, not that there isn't the other. So there's this effective or reactive aggression, which is just, it's reactive. It's not planned. It's not somebody who I thought about this. It just, boom, I did it. Okay, something, you know, something happened. It set me off and I did it. There's high physiologic ar arousal with it, associated with it, and autonomic arousal, all those things that if we're anxious or rage, enraged, versus the opposite is a more predatory aggression. Okay, which is that is somebody who, you know, that, that's, that's the premeditated, I, I carried this out, I had a plan, I was gonna do this to somebody. I was calm, thoughtful, well-planned, everything was done. We don't see that as often. It's not that it doesn't occur. There was 18% in, um, in Weisenberger's study, but much more often we're seeing that sort of reactive aggression that's unplanned. What works, certainly, treat the HH. Okay, that is the one thing that has been shown again and again that both, that if we can treat the HH through their, you know, surgical resection, where they're restoring it, whatever, that has been shown to sort of stabilize and often improve that cognitive and behavioral deterioration. And that has worked better than, you know, because typically people get to surgery because nothing else has worked. And the surgery, you know, it, sometimes folks actually improve. We've seen true improvement in cognitive functions, some even intellectual functions, which was, um, even in my own study, shocking to me. Um, uh, and sometimes, you know, that attention and things like that can improve. And it certainly can improve some of the behavioral functions as well. Other things associated with this, you know, earlier treatment and shorter duration of the epilepsy is better. You know, that, that improves your, your chances of good outcome following a, a surgical resection or ablation. Um, same for behavior as well. And in some cases, at least in our Barrow series, we had a, a few cases that were operated on uh, primarily for more emotional or behavioral reasons. And I'm not suggesting that everybody go out and do that because it's kind of a controversial thing, but we had at least four cases that we wrote up, um, uh, Dr. Kerrigan did and things, where there was you know, pretty dramatic improvement in the behavior where the seizure disorder wasn't as bad as the behavior disorder, and there was some significant improvements there. Other things, you know, play close attention to when the problem behaviors occur. If you can kind of pay attention how that seems to relate to the seizures or not, that might help. If it's something that's really occurring with the seizures, then we want to treat the seizures probably is going to be one of the things more helpful. Working with the psychologist or neuropsychologist, uh, particularly if they are experienced or skilled and willing to work with you on some behavior disorders, some very specific behavior plans, as well as documenting the cognitive functioning. I think most folks should probably be getting some sort of neuropsych eval every few years, probably about every two to three years is a good range because that allows time to change and to, to be able to catch something that's improving or getting worse. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the, the medication management, but definitely if you can get, you know, sometimes psychiatry working with your epileptologist or neurologist to, to work on some of these things, that's gonna be good. Other things to consider that's not, we don't have good research on it, and again, because it's I think a, a somewhat neglected area, but looking at things that we do for brain injury, stroke, autism, some of these other disorders that are out there, what do we know that can work for those things and can we at least try it with HH? 
Uh, some of the neurorehabilitation stuff, cognitive retraining techniques, a lot of times that's occupational therapy, speech therapy, neuro, some neuropsychologists uh, do cog rehab training. Applied behavior analysis, that is something that is uh, probably well-researched and validated for autism and those types of things. Um, so that really very specific using learning principles and looking at the environment, what are the antecedents to behavior, what are the reactions, and keeping that uh, controlled is very important. So the applied behavior analysis tends to be time consuming, but it is well researched, at least in, in autism and those related disorders. And then some social skills training. Fred Frankel and a group out of UCLA have some very nice, well validated um, friendship training groups. There's other social skill groups that are out there as well.